Welcome everyone to this webinar. My name is Julie Merino Carella. I am the director of the Center on Global Energy Policies Women in Energy Program. Uh, the mission of our Women in Energy Program is to elevate women in the energy sector at all career stages by providing educational programming and professional development, creating content that addresses institutional barriers to entry and long-term successes. Uh, and we work with industry to recruit, retain, and promote women into the uh, decision-making roles. We are very excited to be hosting this impressive group of energy leaders for a conversation on carbon capture in California. Uh, the Women Energy Program is hosting this in conjunction to the center's Carbon Management Research Initiative, uh, which is led by Dr. Julio Friedman. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Julio. If anyone is interested in learning more about our Women in Energy Program, please feel free to reach out to me um, or go to our website to find out more. Thank you. Julio, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, my pleasure. And thank you again all for joining us both online and here in our panel and on screen. My name is Julio Friedman. I am a senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University and director of the Carbon Management Research Initiative. Today, we're gonna to discuss carbon capture, use and storage, sometimes called CCUS in California. This is the second event in a series of panel discussions hosted by CGEP's Carbon Management Research Initiative and Women in Energy jointly as part of the Women in Energy CCUS Roadshow. This series features experts and leaders from academia and the public and private sectors discussing policy, technology, and approaches for CO2 removal and greenhouse gas reduction. Let me quickly say this event is being webcast live and full video will be available online in the coming days. For those of you who join us via Zoom, you may submit questions for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. For those of you watching the live stream anywhere else, you may submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag CGEPLive, again, hashtag CGEPLive, and our Twiddle handle at ColumbiaUEnergy. Again, at ColumbiaUEnergy, you can submit questions there. Uh, it is a great privilege and honor to start this discussion with our keynote speaker, a longtime friend and an extraordinary uh, energy and climate expert. Uh, we're joined today by Kate Gordon. Kate is the director of the Office uh, of Planning and Research and is senior advisor to Governor Gavin Newsom on climate. Uh, Kate, among other things, also has worked with Tom Steyer uh, and led the Dirty Business uh, project, among other things. Uh, Kate, it's a delight to have you here. Thank you for joining us and look forward to your comments. Thanks so much, Julio. And it's so nice to be back at the Columbia Center for Global Energy Policy, of which I was a fellow for a couple of years and uh, until I had to abandon all of my affiliations to work for the state of California. So it's it's great to be back um, and, and to see so many friends. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking a little bit about uh, um, California's kind of approach on carbon removal, which is, I would say we're coming to a little bit late um, because the state in some ways has been such a leader on other issues in the climate space, particularly around emissions mitigation um, through our cap and trade program, uh, our, our clean energy standard, our um, low carbon fuel standard that that we haven't had as robust a discussion on this, but but we're starting to. I am gonna share a couple of slides because I like to show pictures while I talk. Um, so I'm gonna do that right now. And let me know if this works. Do you guys see the slide? Uh, yes. Perfect, good, thank you. Thank you for responding. Um, so as I said, California has traditionally uh, been mostly focused on emission mitigation and most of that through technology uh, in, in incentives and, and regulation. We have, though, a goal, which Governor Brown stated in an executive order and Governor Newsom has reiterated, of getting to carbon neutrality by 2045. And it's just increasingly clear that we need to address the CO2 that's currently in the atmosphere. We can't just say let's look at future emissions, let's set a bunch of long-term goals and look at future, future emission mitigation. We really need to look at adaptation and resilience to, to our current atmospheric carbon, as well as at removal. Um, Governor Newsom, I would say this is very in line with his approach in general, which is a very integrated approach on climate, really including 
uh, across the board, land use, economic development, environmental regulation, equity considerations, um, and not kind of confining the conversation to one area. And I'm encouraged to say that I think uh, President-elect Biden um, is in a similar boat in terms of how he's thinking about climate. So this slide is just a, a good illustration of why we need this. Um, uh, this is a from a Lawrence Livermore study that we commissioned, actually, our resources agency commissioned. Um, and it's, it's really, really useful, set out to ask and answer the question of how do we get California to zero? And you see here that we're about 125 megatons short of a million tons short of that. Um, and that's with all of our existing policies, which are very aggressive. Uh, so there's there's lots in there of sort of hard to control sources, hard to decarbonize sources. Um, and uh, the study looked at all the ways to basically uh, get to that zero number by removing CO2 and, and, and really shows how important it is. I should say, especially because Sally's on, that there's a new, and she'll talk about this, a new Energy Futures Initiative in Stanford University study on specific recommendations for California to, uh, to get to zero with negative carbon. And that's adding just a tremendous amount of data and, um, and useful recommendations to the mix. So thank you, Sally, for all your work on that. You guys all know this, but we're looking in California. I just wanted to be really clear, and this is this is actually um, one of my. It's one of those internal things you do that nobody really knows about, but they actually are really important um, to move things forward. Getting everyone to understand that that there are both land-based and engineered carbon removal solutions was was a long process <laughs> of internal education, but I think we're there. So we're really looking on two sides: natural working lands. Um, uh, and also engineered carbon removal. On the land side, the governor just put out a big executive order on getting to 30% 30, uh, 30 of our lands and coastal waters preserve, um, in conservation by 2030. And that's with a specific eye to the potential of those lands to sequester carbon. Our forest management um, efforts are all aimed in that direction as well. On the engineered side, I would say, again, we're not quite as far forward. The thing we do have is a low carbon fuel standard um, that's currently in place that actually already offers quite valuable credits for carbon capture, capture and sequestration. Um, that's being used. We're figuring out ways for it to be used more. But the real question on the table for us, and we have an interagency working group focused on this, is what more can and should we do um, to get to those numbers that you saw in that Livermore report? We, we've got a working group internally looking at opportunities. And I would say we're really kind of settling on three areas. Um, one is a hard to decarbonize industry. So capturing and storing millions of tons of vented carbon dioxide from industrial hydrogen and ethanol production. We're doing some of that, we need to do more. Um, some of it is um, BECs or converting bio, bio, legacy biomass combustion plants to utilize non-combustion technologies to, to get a set, um, ideally to transform woody biomass and agricultural waste to renewable hydrogen. That's a big recommendation from the Livermore report that we're, we're taking very seriously because for a lot of reasons, but one of the biggest ones is we have an enormous amount of woody biomass in the state. We are doing massive amount of forest management and taking all kinds of non-merchantable wood out of the forests. Right now, I'll be honest with you, it's sitting in slash piles on the side of the road and it's internally combusting in a lot of cases um, or just decomposing and, and putting methane into the atmosphere. So we've got to do something smart with it. And it would be very smart if we could turn it into something useful that gets us toward our carbon goals. And the third big area is to look at pilot projects on direct air capture. We're really interested in direct air capture. We'd like California to lead in that space. So those are the three big areas, um, hard to decarbonize industry, non-combustion backs, direct air capture. We have some really good opportunity. This is also the Livermore report in California on the um, storage, sequestration and storage side. This is Julio's world, so I'm not going to pretend to be a geologist, but I will just say that we've got good rocks here in California. Um, and the good and uh, the very good news from an economic development perspective, which is my background about this, is that the places where we have the good rocks, um, are also, not coincidentally, the places where we have a lot of oil and gas industry. Um, these are uh, the kinds of rock that for uh, a long time have held our oil deposits. These are also areas of the state that have uh, a large percent of skilled workers who understand geology and understand carbon management. And so the theory is, can we figure out a way to really prioritize 
carbon removal, carbon sequestration in these areas, for instance, um, down in the southern part, that's essentially Bakersfield, Kern County, up in the northern part is the Sacramento River Delta. Can we prioritize a transition, make this part of our just transition strategy from our oil and gas production, extraction, re refining industry um, to, uh, to something that's much more focused on carbon, on, on uh, uh, carbon neutrality? So my office runs the state's just transition policy. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about this. And then finally, I just wanted to say, you know, whatever we do in California, um, uh, we do kind of starting with core principles. And, and I already talked about the first one, really, the hard to decarbonize sectors um, uh, and, and, and our priority. Um, importantly, the third part priority uh, around just transition, the fourth around vulnerable communities and engagement from an early early part of the process, um, and then the fifth around public health and community, you'll see basically here the two core values of our administration, which are climate inequity. Um, we are trying to figure out a way toward a sustainable, resilient, um, inclusive economy on carbon removal and carbon neutrality that, um, that actually provides opportunities, not only to those currently in high carbon industries, but also to those who have been left out of those industries and left out of prior economic booms. And so this is our goal. And, and the last thing I'll say is that the governor, basically the governor's MO on this stuff is, look, when we have a clear policy direction that aligns with our climate and equity goals, he always says we roll out the red carpet, not the red tape. So where we are right now is working to get to that point, to get to the internal buy-in, the stakeholder discussions, to have that clear policy direction. And then I am very confident that California will lead in this space. So I am going to leave it at that for my opening remarks um, and turn things back to Julio. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, I was gonna ask you a handful of questions, but you basically tagged everything I was gonna ask about. Oh, good. <laughs> with, with one exception, but I'm not even gonna ask you that. I'm gonna ask other people that. The thing that I do wanna ask you though is in the context of California leadership, there are opportunities here, not only for decarbonization, but also for demonstration to a global community and to build new manufacturing, new export opportunities. I wondered if you could just briefly comment on how you think about that in the context of the state. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, California, um, in some ways, I think we've modeled this and the mitigation side. We are very good at being the place that does the kind of early early project, the patents. We have a, a disproportionate number of the clean energy patents in the world. Um, uh, I think that that there's no question that we would like to be on the leading edge here. Um, I think a challenge, I'll just be honest, a challenge in California, a lot of that work we've done in innovation has been <clears throat> in the tech sector where you don't have these big capital intensive projects. Here with carbon removal, these are big capital intensive projects. They're, they're, they're big and clunky. Um, and so I think we have to do a little bit of a shift in, in thinking um, both with our venture capital community and our investors on what kinds of things they should invest in. Um, and also just with the communities in these areas that are very sensitive to big industrial projects, honestly. I mean, they're sort of like, our EJ communities are like, why should you put yet another big industrial project in a place where we've had all these big industrial projects? So I think we've got some, some work to do to get there, um, but there's no question, if there's one thing COVID has really underscored for California, it's that we, um, we need to diversify our overall state economy. We actually need to do more manufacturing and be a little bit more diversified because we've been so hard hit by COVID in retail services, which are just a huge part of our economy. Um, and, uh, and there's actually a need for us to be looking a little bit, um, looking for a little bit more stability um, and also frankly for the good jobs that come with manufacturing. So we're definitely talking about that, Julio. It's part of an economic development strategy. I guess the last thing I'll say is that from my perspective, and it's partly why I work on this, this is really an economic development strategy more than it is an environmental strategy at this point. We're really talking about sort of how do we look at the assets we have, take advantage of them and build toward, you know, kind of this diversified sustainable economy and what pieces do we need to get there? And I feel pretty good about it. I think, I think a lot of things, including uh, Sally's report, the Livermore report, frankly, the, the IPCC 1.5 degree report have really underscored the need to make removal a major part of our climate strategies. So I feel like we're in the how phase, not the why phase at this point. 
Excellent, thank you so much. I'm pleased to see that we already have questions coming in the Q&A, some of them directed directly at you, Kate. Uh, but rather than go to Q&A, uh, your lead in about capital intense projects and the, how, how hard tech and tough tech is sometimes hard to finance and get going is an excellent lead in for our first panelist. Uh, please allow me the pleasure of introducing Dr. Alyssa Park. Dr. Park is director of the Lenfest Center of Sustainable Energy at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Uh, I've known Alyssa for a very long time. She is an international class expert on carbon capture of all kinds, CO2 conversion to use, and CO2 removal. Uh, we're delighted to have you here, Alyssa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julio. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. I was not going to share slides, but I thought um, looking at the slide we just saw, I thought we can share a few. Just can a few. Yes, we can. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for Kate's great introduction because this is a very interesting time. And I think many of you already remember the Paris Agreement or the discussion we had. And then we had a little bit of hiccup <laughs> in the, along the way. But I think hopefully we'll go back to getting really serious about the climate change and how to develop the mitigation technologies. As a chemical engineer, well, I'm very much interested in CCUS technology development and deployment. As you can see here, climate change is not a short bridge type of technology or problem we need to address. This will be generations to come. So in a sense that global society or even governments got together and say that not only we need to advance the technology we already have, we need to have a technology which will be implementing 2050, 2100, which means that we need to fund uh, advance fundamental science not only developing technology we already have. These are the kind of eight buckets of the technology areas and which were identified. And then in fact, the CCUS carbon capture utilization and storage is one of those areas. And you can read more about these technologies in this report we published in 2018. As Kate mentioned, we're not gonna go down to only zero emission, we're gonna be even doing negative emission technologies. Means that whatever technology, either doing it through biomass or direct air capture, in net, we wanna have CO2 from atmosphere is being stored underground. In order to do this, so there's a lot of science we have to end technology we need to advance. And I'm sure that you will hear a lot more about it from Sally. This is one of the Sally's famous uh, plots showing that what happens if we start using earth as a storage tank or reactor for carbon dioxide. One thing I do wanna mention is that if you're serious about climate change mitigation, you do have to do carbon capture and storage. But at the same time, there was a kind of interesting discussion start happening about 2010, around that time, very seriously about how about utilizing CO2 once we capture them. So let's look around your room. Uh, take a look at the materials you see. Uh, can you pick out the one item that does not have any carbon in it? I'm sure it'd be very, very difficult, including yourself. You have a lot of carbon in you as well. So when you think about it, if we don't use any carbon, fossil carbon for the future, that will be the best thing for carbon management, one of the important thing to do. So when you look at how to sustain our society for the future with all these carbon bearing materials, we cannot remove carbon, but perhaps we can defossilize chemicals and materials and fuels even. So how much can we do? So this is one of the latest report by McKenzie published in June, 2020 this year. And it was quite interesting because their projection in 2030 will have a significant CO2 utilization. I'm really hoping that this storage bubble is a lot bigger than it is, and I hope so by 2030. But at the same time, we can definitely use it in enhanced recovery, construction materials, fuels, and polymers, all these are good areas to put carbon in it. So, what happens uh, in this uh, scheme? Why haven't we done this for a long time? Because we did not have carbon free energy. Once you have a low carb energy um, CO2, we have to boost it up that energy and putting energy in to make chemicals and fuels and materials. So this becomes quite interesting for California because California have been implementing renewable energy so much so fast 
so that now we have intermittent energy we can use to convert CO2 to useful materials. We need chemicals, uh, the good catalysts to do that so, but we also need a coal reactant. So there's a whole discussion integrating CO2 utilization and conversion with the hydrogen production. So overall, hopefully one day we'll do CCS sooner than later to have negative emission for sure, but hopefully we'll complete the cycle of carbon and creating a new carbon economy. And I will be happy to answer any questions. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa, for that uh, quick overview. Uh, 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 Alyssa is modest about her uh, qualifications and understanding. She really is a deep, deep expert on all of the engineering aspects of everything she just mentioned. Uh, we are blessed, however, to have an equally impressive scholar on the geoscience side. This is uh, Dr. Sally Benson, who's a professor at Stanford University. She is the co-director of the Precourt Institute for Energy uh, and director of the Global Climate and Energy Project at Stanford as well. Also former director, uh, sorry, former deputy director of our own Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory here in California. I, I have the pleasure of knowing Sally at least since 2002. She is one of the longest lived uh, scholars in this uh, arena and began publishing works on carbon capture use and storage as far back as 1997. We're just really glad to have Sally here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Julia. Well, I sound really old, <laughs> but uh, I, I did actually start working on carbon management in 1997, actually 1996. Uh, and, uh, and actually my earliest work on carbon management was in, in an area that we now call nature-based solutions or uh, you know, natural carbon solutions. And I worked with the Department of Energy to establish two centers. Uh, one was on terrestrial uh, sequestration uh, and the other one was on ocean carbon sequestration. And at the time, those were really perceived to have the biggest potential. And it's so interesting to sort of look at full circle because nowadays, uh, you know, the Livermore Report and, you know, many studies, National Academies and so forth are really emphasizing the uh, potential role of, of uh, natural climate solutions. But, uh, but going back uh, to a little bit earlier, so it was about, I think, 1998, and I was sent a copy of a PowerPoint present, uh, presentation uh, from the uh, head of the DOE's Office of Science. And it was from Rob Sokolow, of course, somebody we all know well. Uh, and he had put together a presentation on carbon capture and storage, you know, industrial carbon capture and storage and ge deep geological formations. And, uh, and being a geoscientist, I looked at this and I said, this is ludicrous. You know, there's no way that this could ever work. So the first publication I ever did was an assessment of the uh, CO2 uh, capture and storage potential in California. Um, and, and, and my point was to sort of show that it would be impossible. There just wasn't enough volume underground. Well, that was a very naive notion. And I did the study and out of it came that we had a thousand years of CO2 storage potential. Uh, in California, if we were storing all the CO2 that we were generating. So that really opened up my eyes and <clears throat> really got me to focus on this. And being a geoscientist, this was a very natural place, uh, natural place to work. So, uh, so a lot of work has been done in California on carbon capture and storage potential. Uh, there was the West Carb program that was actually led by the California Energy Commission. And that was a 10 year effort to uh, get a much deeper understanding of the geologic storage potential. Uh, there were detailed studies done, there was wells drilled to, to get information. Uh, there were assessment of sources and source sink matching. Uh, and basically that really laid the foundation for understanding that California has a, a rich set of opportunities. However, when all that work was done, there were really no significant policy incentives that would uh, help a, a, a business make the case that this was uh, something that they could invest in and, and, and uh, you know, uh, expect a reasonable return on those investments. So that's fundamentally changed. Uh, we now have the 45Q uh, tax legislation that allows 35 or provides $35 a ton for CO2 storage in, um, 
in oil and gas fields and $50 per ton for CO2 storage in um, uh, saline formation, so pure storage. Uh, so, so that is an economic incentive. And then the second one, very importantly in California, probably has the most um, attractive incentive, which is something called the low carbon fuel standard, which is a, a, a trading scheme that, um, that supports the decarbonization of transportation fuels. And uh, currently, that's last time I looked, it was trading at about $200 per ton of CO2. And, and even more than it being a very... Um, favorable economic incentive for CCS, the, uh, the uh, California Air Resources Board developed a protocol for CO2 capture and storage. So that fundamentally changed the context because now there was an economic driver. So that brings me to the EFI study. So this was a collaboration between the Energy Futures Initiative uh, and Stanford University to take a deep dive looking at the context today for under uh, what circumstances could uh, CO2 capture and storage help the state achieve its deep decarbonization goals and which of those opportunities were economically attractive. So the bottom line is we found uh, 60 million tons of CO2 uh, that could be captured and stored uh, with, the, with the current incentives. Those were allocated between industry and the electricity sector. Uh, because our work actually shows that, that adding a small amount of CCS to the electricity sector will dramatically cut the cost for achieving a net zero uh, electricity system and actually could be done faster, faster and cheaper. So, so we think that's an important opportunity as well. Uh, so, so taking all this together, what we found though is that the current set of economic incentives are only sufficient to make 20 million tons a year uh, economically uh, attractive today to, to private sector investors, which is fantastic. That's 20 million tons we can be, you know, <clears throat> avoiding emitting today if we can just get on with it. But the other six, 40 million tons will require extra financial incentives. So, so moving beyond that, we did a sort of deep dive into what kind of policy measures would be needed to support uh, increased action on the part of the private sector. Um, the first one is that California really needs to clarify um, it, its, uh, its goals and intentions towards the role of CCS for achieving climate objectives. And it's great to hear Kate uh, here talking about the very deliberative approach they're doing to, to, to assess this. Um, second one is, is that there's really an untested uh, and complex regulatory regime that uh, makes private inve investors uh, nervous uh, about being able to get their projects going quickly enough. Uh, third is the area of financial uh, uncertainties, which are also a damper on investment because many of the incentives that I talked about uh, have uh, sunsets or, or uh, in 2030 or, or slightly past that. Uh, which, which again is not sufficiently long to warrant those investments. And then finally, we really need to begin to engage the public more about these topics. And, um, and I think I'll stop there. And Julio, you're on mute. Julio, you're on mute. Yeah. I can't hear you. I should be unmuted now, sorry. Oh, yes, you're unmuted. Okay, anyway, I'm done, yeah. There we go. Thank you. Uh, and again, uh, for those of you who are interested in the study that Sally mentioned, uh, I'm going to add this now. Oh, Sally already added it. Uh, no, she. I'm going to add it now to the panelists and attendees. Uh, this is the report which was released uh, just one month ago. Uh, uh, it done in partnership with Stanford University and the Energy Futures Initiative. Um, in order to deploy. Uh, carbon capture and storage anywhere, you need more than technology and you need more than natural resource. You also need regulations, you need laws, you need finance, uh, you need a public acceptance, you need a great number of things in order for projects to become real and for success to appear. In that context, I am thrilled to have with us Brianna Mordick-Schmidt uh, from Lawrence Livermore National Lab I've known Brianna for only 10 years by comparison with the other panelists, uh, but Brianna uh, spent much of her career actually working at Natural Resources Defense Council on these issues in the state specifically, and is now focused again on trying to think through what is necessary to get deployment in the whole. 
with that, uh, welcome Brianna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julio, and uh, thanks for the invitation to participate in this great event. It's an exciting topic. Um, so my background is in petroleum geology. So my introduction to CCS uh, was working on a CO2 enhanced oil recovery project, um, which is where CO2 is captured from a point source and injected underground to uh, increase oil production from aging oil fields. Um, so that is um, to date been the primary way that CO2 has been stored underground, um, but the volume of storage available for those types of projects is nowhere near the volume that we need um, to eventually store. Um, and ironically, actually for a time, well, and perhaps even now, um, the limit to doing more CO2 EOR was the availability of CO2, um, which seems quite strange given the massive problem we have with it uh, being emitted to the atmosphere. So uh, from, from there, um, from working for the oil industry, as Julio mentioned, I uh, moved to the Natural Resources Defense Council, where I was working more at the intersection of science and policy, um, looking at ways to safely um, expand and deploy carbon capture use and sequestration. Um, so a lot of that work focused on a new regulatory program um, that was being written called the uh, Class 6 Underground Injection Control Program. So the Safe Drinking Water Act is the law that um, is used to protect uh, the nation's drinking water resources. Under that program, there's something called the Underground Injection Control Program, which is the program that uh, regulates any type of fluid injection um, underground in the United States. So in 2010, um, the Environmental Protection Agency, which runs the UIC program, created a new class of um, underground injection control well called Class 6 which was specifically designed to regulate the underground injection of CO2 for long-term storage. Um, it's an extremely robust program. Um, and it's, as Sally mentioned, a largely untested program as well. Um, there have been very few class six permits issued to date. And those permits that have been issued took quite a long time to be issued. Um, so there is a, a very robust regulatory program in place for carbon capture and storage, but it is quite complex. Um, and so they think there's certainly work to do in figuring out how those rules are gonna be implemented in the real world, um, how all those rules layer on top of each other and how to best coordinate. Um, I think California is really well positioned to take the lead, um, not only because of the you know, world-class geologic storage resources in the state, um, but because um, you know we have, so many um, experts in the state at doing this. So a lot of work to be done on figuring out how this will actually be implemented in practice. Um, but it's critical um, as you know, Kate showed in the, in the report that we put out, um, geologic storage is not only critical to carbon capture and capturing carbon from those really hard to decarbonize sources, but it's critical to negative emissions technologies as well. Um, so a lot of work to be done, but a lot of promise that California can be a leader in, in deploying it. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Uh, we're already getting a huge number of questions coming in. Uh, over the course of the next 20 minutes or half hour, uh, I will ask a set of questions to the panel, which I hope will touch on a number of these issues. Uh, uh, these are questions which we've seen many times in the past. I'm not surprised to see them here. The good news is that we have something like 25 years of scholarship and deployment and experience that we can use to answer these things. I'm gonna actually start with uh, an obvious question that comes up frequently, which is just the cost. What is the cost of carbon capture in say the power plant or a refinery or an ethanol plant or any of these kinds of things? Uh, I open that to anybody, but uh, Dr. Park, you're the expert. Why don't you start? Sure, um, I think right now, Hard to know. We were hoping that we get better number from Petronova project, but um, I don't think we got the number. I don't know, Julio, did you see any number from them in terms right, of Right, so, so Petronova all in costs of uh, carbon capture transportation and storage is $100 a ton. Uh, the same company, Mitsubishi, is now offering $80 a ton as a commercial offering. Yeah, so I think most of the point source capture is between about $60 per ton, I will say. And a lot of times that includes the compression costs. So there will be point source. In terms of direct air capture, I think numbers widely vary. And I think um, hard to quote one number at this time, I think. 
But one thing I do want to mention is that depending on the application, either injection, direct air capture and injection directly at the site, it will reduce the uh, transportation cost. Or if you're utilizing CO2 directly at the site, you might not need to capture CO2 at pure form and compress it under 150 atmospheric pressure, which will have a significant reduction in cost. So when you combine different approaches together, we might get another energy and uh, cost savings. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's also probably worth mentioning that uh, there, the cost really varies quite a lot by the CO2 concentration. Yes. And so the, the, the $60 is kind of at the low end for lower concentration streams, it might be more expensive. In that, uh, I want people to know that we uh, recently republished a report on this issue with respect to the costs and value of carbon capture specifically from our center this is a report net zero and geospheric return. Again, I've just added it to the chat function for you here. Uh, similar kind of question is often on this. Go so, ahead, Sally, please. Maybe I could just say a little bit about uh, direct air capture, for example, compared to uh, con con capture from concentrated sources. So as Alyssa said, the amount of energy that it takes to capture CO2 depends on the concentration. And so if we look at uh, uh, air, it's 400 parts per million. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, CO2 concentration, if we look at uh, like a a gas plant that might be, you know, three percent carbon dioxide. So if you look at the minimum work or the, the 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 smallest amount of energy that it would take to capture CO2 from air, as compared to from a more concentrated source, it's anywhere from say two to three times more energy. So that's a little bit of an indication that fundamentally, uh, you know, CO2 capture from air will be at least more energetically costly um, than capture from concentrated sources. We also have a specific question to that, to the point of the uh, carbon footprint of that energy. Uh, in order to have the best environmental performance, you want enough low carbon energy to do the job. That's true for conventional carbon capture or for direct air capture. How confident are you guys that we can deliver enough low carbon energy to do this work, along with the other demands that low carbon energy has? Yeah, well, well, maybe I'll just sort of take a quick stab at that. I mean, if you if you look at um, capture from uh, a, a, an existing energy source, <clears throat> you know, you basically just need to divert some of the energy from that initial application, like producing power, to devoting that, that energy to capturing the carbon. So. From the perspective of a, of a fossil fuel capture, you know, you've got enough energy, you just need to capture all those emissions that occur in the, in the process of not only generating power, but capturing the CO2 itself. Uh, with regard to renewable generation uh, as a source of power, I mean, there are massive amounts of uh, solar energy available, uh, wind energy available, you know, it, it, it it's not clear it's going to be there when and where you need it, but certainly the, the size of those resources is also, also enormous. So it may be worth, go ahead. So uh, right now, we were uh, pleasantly surprised that uh, renewable energy installation is faster than what we anticipated, which is great. But at the same time, it is kind of challenged with energy storage, as everybody knows. So we are hoping that energy integration of renewable energy integration into grid goes as fast as we've been doing and even faster. At the same time, uh, I think some of the questions on um, non-carbon hydrogen carrier or these kind of lump sum into together. So when you have um, abundant intermittent but abundant renewable energy electricity or heat, how are we going to store it for long term, not for half an hour or minutes? Can we do it months at a time? The energy density is a lot higher with carbon bearing materials so that now for the kind of first time, renewable energy sector and um, CCUS sector has a synergistic interest into how to do manipulation of this high dense energy carrier by using renewable energy. But one day we have a good efficient uh, batteries, we should decarbonize the power sector first. But interesting way, because the slow development in energy storage, CCUS came in, CO2 utilization came in a little earlier than we anticipated, which is we're not complaining about. So I think the deployment of these technologies will be phased in unique way in the future. Mm -hmm. I want to actually circle back later on the issue of CO2 use and synthetic fuels and these kinds of things. We have some questions on that. 
first, if you allow me, I would want to pivot to some questions we've received about the safety of geological storage, about the risks that are involved, uh, everything from the fact that you displace brine, so what happens to the brines, to are we worried about earthquakes. Um, uh, in, in many cases, on panels like this, I'm the person who knows the most. On this case, I'm not. <laughs> Sally actually knows way more about these things than me. Uh, yeah, well, I don't think that's true, Julio, but anyway, I, I I'll, do, I'll, but take, I'll take the question. So maybe starting with um, when you inject CO2 um, and it's displacing formation water, which it does, it has to push it out of the way, uh, where does all that water go? So the idea is, is that if you're doing geologic storage, you pick a, a geologic formation that is so huge that when you inject the CO2, it only occupies a very small fraction of the overall volume of the system. And so even though that water is being pushed away, that the formation itself can accommodate that uh, slight volume of CO2 because um, that the water becomes slightly more dense and the pore spaces become slightly bigger when you uh, inject, that, inject that fluid. So, uh, so basically it's just a, a drop in the bucket would be a, a, way to, a way to think about that question. Um, then regarding the question of earthquakes, uh, so all of our studies, we, we applied a screening that, uh, that screened out any areas with uh, active seismicity, any areas with, with faulting, uh, also sensitive ecosystems, high population density areas and so forth. So we applied a lot of screens when we came up with our capacity assessment. So, uh, so we did eliminate those areas that are near faults. We wouldn't want to do that. Nobody, nobody would want to do that. So it turns out the Great Central Valley, uh, which runs from north to south in the state, is actually very, very stable geologically and, um, and, and is a very safe and secure place to store CO2. And part of the evidence for that is that there's actually an awful lot of oil and gas that's trapped. And that oil and gas is trapped for millions and millions of years. So, so there's also a natural analog that proves that buoyant fluids, you know, fluids that are less dense than water can be safely trapped for um, millions of years. Yeah, and important to note that, you know, doing this in the right place in the right way is not something that we just rely on um, operators of these projects to do voluntarily. It's required by you know a very robust set of regulations um, that they very carefully evaluate the site, do computational modeling to figure out where the CO2 will move underground. They monitor that throughout the life of the project and afterwards to make sure that nothing is leaking. Um, so there's, there's a strong set of rules in place to make sure that it's done correctly. Excellent. I was hoping you might take a moment, uh, Brianna, and actually talk just a little bit about the CCS protocol and its history in the state uh, as ARB uh, developed it. Uh, I know that that was something you were personally involved in. Uh, you had a ringside seat to how that evolved and, and how it ended up being so sort of helpful uh, and also so, uh, what's the right way to say this, rigorous in its application. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as, as others have mentioned, um, CCS is an eligible um, activity to generate credits under the California's low carbon fuel standard, which is a, a critical incentive to help get these projects built. Um, you know, I think as we've been discussing, technology isn't the limiting factor, it's really the cost. And so having these types of incentives is really important to, to being able to scale CCS. So the, the CCS protocol, which explains, you know, what you have to do to actually be eligible to receive those credits, it started based on the class six rules. So the federal rules that the Environmental Protection Agency wrote for geologic sequestration, but it goes um, actually even beyond that um, in terms of its requirements and stringency. Um, and so, you know, I think that was a very strong basis for them to start with was those rules. And then, you know, they, um, you know, worked with a lot of experts um, in the state and nationally to, to develop those even further. Um, the U, UIC rules, the classics rules are really designed to protect drinking water, um, whereas the CCS protocol rules are really designed to ensure that um, CO2 is not going to leak back out since you're getting credits for putting it underground. Um, and so again, they're, they're, um, they're very similar, um, but have, you know, slightly different end goals. And so some of the differences are, are reflected in the in those differences in goals are reflected in the differences in the rules. Um, again, as you know, Sally mentioned, um, those rules are also largely untested. Um, as far as I know, no one's actually received an approved 
um, pathway yet for CCS unless somebody knows differently. Um, but yeah, they're they're extremely robust. Um, I think there are maybe some concerns that in some places they're um, too strict. <laughs> um, but again, that'll be uh, something that that's going to be tested as we see um, a lot of people um, interested in moving projects forward. And that was in many cases spurred by the availability of these credits. Sally, you look like you want to add something to that. Uh, no, no, I'm actually reading the questions and I was looking at the question. No, I'm good. Yeah. So okay. there are lots That's of excellent. great comments and questions and yeah, so tons of topics. Yes, uh, I actually want to turn to one that came in that I, th I think is kind of uh, reflects back on not only something that you just said, Brianna, but also something that uh, Sally had mentioned earlier. Um, we have a pretty clear regulatory framework for CCS in the United States with the Class 6 wells. We have a pretty clear regulatory framework in California uh, with the CCUS protocol. One of the questions, even given that work, there's still some uncertainties. There's questions about long-term liability, access to the poor volume, these kinds of questions. What do you think are the prospects for amending or modifying these statutes to have more clarity? Um, that's a good question. I can, I guess, take a first stab and then I'm sure Sally and others would have some input. Um, there is a, a formal process, well, periodically, uh, the California Air Resources Board, um, which is the one, the um, agency that administers the LCFS, the Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program, um, reviews their protocols. Um, and I think, you know, people have been having discussions with them about pieces of the, um, the CCS protocol, you know, where there are concerns um, and where, you know, revisions might need to be made. Um, but as you mentioned, Julio, there are also all these other sort of outstanding questions that I think would be really helpful to solve, like the, the long-term liability, you know, who ultimately is responsible for the CO2, you know, years or decades after it gets put underground. Um, as you mentioned, it's not totally clear in the U.S. Um, who actually owns the pore space that the CO2 would be injected into. Um, we have in the U.S. a sort of interesting situation where um, you may own the land, but you may not own the, what they call the mineral rights underneath it. Um, and so it's not clear whether it's the mineral rights owner or the surface owner who owns that pore space. Um, so yeah, I think those questions are, are gonna be important to resolve to give people the, the comfort to move forward with these projects. Yeah, maybe I can say a little bit about that. I mean, regarding the pore space, um, many uh, states, or not many, several states, in the United States have already made a determination about this. And I think the simple and most straightforward thing to do is to you know, have a um, you know, legislative decision, for example, that the poor space is owned by the surface owner, unless, for example, it's already poor space that's tied up with another mineral right like oil or gas. Um, and so that if you live over a piece of property and there's a saline formation there, that, that you, know, you own the rights to store CO2 in that pore space and anybody who wants to use your pore space would need to uh, negotiate um, with you or your collection of, and your collection of neighbors uh, about access to that pore space. I think that's something that could be done. There's precedent in the oil and gas industry. That's sort of exactly how they do that. Um, you know, it takes some work, but it's it's certainly doable, and uh, there's no takeaway uh, whatsoever for people. Actually, it's uh, being sort of given something that that perhaps there was lack of clarity about in the past. Um, regarding the long-term liability, I, I think the solution is really to create um, some kind of trust fund that is administered uh, and overseen by the government whereby a certain amount of funds are put in. So say for every ton of CO2 that you put underground that stays there, that is intended to stay there permanently, you make a small contribution, just like an insurance fund. And, and, and long after the project is done um, uh, and, and you've uh, completed your uh, abandoning the field and you've followed all the regulatory protocols to shut that down. Um, but there, then after that point where there's the transfer of liability, there are then financial resources that would be available. And these are shared amongst all the people doing CCS projects. And, uh, you know, I, again, I think that, um, you know, this is something that, that, uh, that can be done and it will be cost effective, it won't be overly burdensome and it will provide that confidence uh, that there is uh, 
that there are funds and oversight for in, in the long term. But one more very important point, I mean, all the studies we've done show that the security of storage actually increases over time. So after you put the CO2 underground, it's not like it gets riskier and riskier. In fact, it's just the reverse. Uh, you know, at some point far out into the future, there's you know essentially a negligible uh, risk that CO2 would uh, migrate someplace where uh, it could cause harm to groundwater or ecological resources or return into the atmosphere. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, I know that Kate is still here. Uh, I don't know if she's interested in joining, but there's been a question. I'm here. That's been excellent. Uh, if you're willing to take a question, sure. we received one on the economic development side, um, which is, uh, it, it's, it's, I think they're asking for a bit more of an expansion of the things that you mentioned already about what the jobs prospects look like in a just transition associated yeah, it's with a carbon capture. It's a great question. I mean, I think um, uh, at the at the highest level, what I what I'll say and always say about just transition is that I think it's it's really a mistake to think of that as a one for one job replacement kind of approach. Um, really, what it is is just a an understanding that we are in a transition of the economy toward a carbon neutral economy. California has been very clear that's what we're doing. That means that there will be shifts in uh, growth sectors and industries, and those shifts will have regional implications. So. I think really what we're trying to do overall in our just transition work is to look at economic diversification in the regions of the state that have partic been particularly dependent on, in this case, oil and gas jobs. Um, that's also true, frankly, in like the timber areas of the state for those jobs or areas that are going to have to scale back agricultural production because of water resource issues. I mean, there's there's a number of issues in this. So economic diversification in general, I think what's exciting to us about this area is that there are actually some places where the skills of workers in oil and gas sector will match up well with the skills needed to do carbon capture and sequestration. And they happen to be geographically like located in very similar parts of the state. So we're looking to say, okay, what are our current assets, whether it's um, manufacturing capability, whether it's industrial uh, land zoning um, and workforce skills, and how do we think about leveraging those assets as we're looking at a carbon removal strategy. So I know that was a long answer, but I just always feel like I have to start with, we're not talking about a one forward replacement and nobody should ever think that's what just transition is because that's just never true for economic transformation. I do wanna add one very brief thing though. Something that is often missed in this discussion is if you retrofit an existing facility for carbon capture, you automatically get a profound reduction in criteria pollutants. And uh, this has been demonstrated over and over and over again, sulfur, NOx, particulates, all of these sorts of things. Uh, and that's because carbon capture equipment requires very clean streams. So you have to clean the flue gas up before it can go to that. And you do get uh, very real pollution reductions with that. I know that when some people think about just transition, they think about health, they think about disadvantaged communities and the impacts on that. And in many cases, we'll actually see a benefit associated with the deployment of CCS. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, tech, traditionally just transition means the job side because that it's, it's a very old term um, that's been kind of rekindled, um, but you're absolutely right. There are also community benefits that are about transition of the economy as a whole on entire communities. I think that's a really great point. Julio, and also just a reminder, and you said this, a lot of this is job retention, right? It's like, we're seeing this in California right now. We have a number of refineries that are closing because of um, uh, honestly just global oil issues. I mean, the crude oil uh, import issues and they're transitioning to renewable fuels. That's a job retention conversation and a community benefit conversation more than it is a new job creation conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, before we uh, open up directly to questions, I, I wanna ask across the panel about a set of questions that have been coming in around CO2 utilization. Uh, to sort of kick off the discussion, many people are enthusiastic about the idea of turning CO2 into renewable fuels, especially using direct air capture. A lot of people are interested in the commercial opportunities associated with turning CO2 into value products, whether it's plastic, or concrete, or something else. Um, I want to ask sort of two provocative sort of uh, leading questions around this. One of them, what is the you know, commercial interest and opportunity around CO2 use? And second of all, what do we think is the long-term climate opportunity associated with those same things? 
uh, maybe start with Alyssa. Sure. Um, in addition to the mission innovation report, we actually, uh, Julio and I and many others worked on the roadmap, right? And I think in that uh, National Petroleum Council roadmap for CCUS, we really tried to identify the interest from industry on various CCU to utilization technologies. Interestingly, globally, um, I think that uh, cement industry or construction materials are already there. Not really particularly because of CO2 is added bonus, but at the beginning, they were trying to address their solid waste management issues. So steel industries or uh, cement industries, they have a lot of large amount of the solid waste, including waste energy plant and power plant having ashes. How to put them into product is to have a multiple environmental and economic benefits. So I think there are a number of good startup companies as well as large companies commercializing these. So I don't think we need even more push and it would be definitely good push given 45Q and these incentives. In terms of uh, chemicals and materials, that one is a little longer term, definitely, because you need to have a lot more renewable energy. But there's an incentive because all the large energy companies or chemical companies are now anticipating one day they cannot get crude oil, depending on crude oil, to make their products. So I think there's a lot of interest going into that area right now, even at the companies. And what they're anticipating is their business will be quite different by the time 2040, 2050, and how they're gonna manipulate carbon to sustain their business. Sally, something to add? A little bit about um, making fuels from carbon dioxide. Um, so if you make, fuels from carbon dioxide that's been captured from a, um, a point source like a coal plant or a gas plant. Um, and then you, you know, take the energy to, to synthesize a, a fuel. Um, you, um, you may offset um, the need for other fuel, uh, but eventually when you burn that fuel, you put the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. <clears throat> so, so it's not really a carbon neutral process. So if you were to capture CO2 from the air and then make a fuel, that would genuinely be carbon neutral as long as all the energy that you use along the way is also uh, carbon neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's one, I think, confusion. Just because you're using uh, CO2 captured from the air doesn't mean you're removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It just makes it means carbon neutrality. Mm -hmm. So then I think that you know, direct air capture and then making fuels is going to have competitors um, like biofuels, you could make carbon neutral uh, biofuels. Uh, so I think there it will come down to two, two questions, you know, economics, you know, who can do it more cheaply? And, and, and scale, you know, which, which one can have the scale that you need. Um, so then, but there are other carbon neutral, or carbon neutral fuels. It could be hydrogen. It could be a hydrogen sourced from electrolysis. It could be hydrogen, um, you know, sourced from uh, uh, natural gas plus steam methane, with steam methane reforming and carbon capture. Um, so, so it's also going to have to compete economically with that. The other thing is, if you want to make fuels from carbon dioxide, you also need to make hydrogen. So electrolysis or some way of making that has to be the first step. Then you have to capture the, the CO2. So it's all the energy um, that will take to do that. And then you have to synthesize this product. So, so there's going to be a lot of competition for what are going to be our carbon neutral fuels. I don't know the answer. You know, it's going to be a big race. Certainly fuels that have carbon in them are extremely valuable because we know how to transport them. We know how to store them. They have very, very high energy density. So there are a lot of advantages, but there's going to be competition in that space. And, and I think we'll, you know, have to see how it plays out. I hope there's really vigorous competition because that will get us better products and lower prices. Uh, the only thing I'd add to that is that, um, you know, I think utilizing CO2 is going to be an important complement to, but it certainly can't replace the need for underground storage. And that's just because of the sheer scale of CO2 removal and capture that we need to achieve to meet climate goals. Um, so the International Energy Agency estimated that from now to 2070, we need to remove or capture about 240 gigatons or 240 billion tons of CO2. 
Um, and they estimated that only about 8% of that would go towards utilization. Um, and so that just shows that, you know, it's important uh, to look at these utilization pathways and, you know, they could provide, um, you know, a way to bring down the cost of capture by having these saleable products, but we will still need to do a lot of underground storage. Uh, in, in that context, uh, th there's a whole set of questions that I want to ask everybody, but please allow me to first thank Kate Gordon. She has to go off and continue her important work uh, with the governor's office. Thank you so much, Kate, for joining us. It was a delight to have you here. Thank you, everybody. And thanks so much for those who joined. Um, we'll keep working together. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm. So, so far we've received something like 120 questions. I'm pleased to say we've already beaten back about 50 of them, but there's a lot more to go and they're coming in fast and furious. I consider this a sign of success. I'm delighted that we have so much interest in that. I wanna actually do just a couple of quick lightning round questions and then a big question to the panel. Uh, does that sound okay? You guys are interested in that? Yeah. Uh, we had a question here for Alyssa about capture rate and about the fact that a lot of the work has been sort of focused on 90% capture. The question is how far can we go beyond that? What does it look like for 99% capture? Oh, I see. So 90, 95% capture of CO2 is from point sources. So when you talk about direct air capture, target is usually 60%. Because uh, lower the finer concentration is very hard to get. So it's not linear cost uh, in terms of how much CO2 per cost per ton of CO2. So then getting the last drop of CO2 be way too much more expensive, similar to the challenge of the drug air capture. So more likely we'll be just doing 90, 95% in the point source capture and hopefully we'll complement with the drug air capture, which is about 60% target. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add a little bit to that. So in terms of capture from point sources, so people have used the number 90% um, as sort of a practical achievable number, but there are studies now saying that 95% is possible, uh, even, even higher, you know, even 99%. And there are actually technologies that will capture 100%, such as um, the uh, the alum cycle uh, kind of technology, which basically have completely zero emissions, and you basically run a power generation cycle uh, with uh, supercritical CO2 as the working fluid, and 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 under those circumstances, all of the fuel. Uh, eventually ends up underground. Um, and that includes all criteria pollutants, all CO2. Yeah, so there are some very exciting new power generation technologies coming along that have 100% capture. Uh, also, they use zero water, which I think is, a, is an immense benefit from those technologies. Quite better than that, they're actually net water positive. Yeah. Um, right. They create water as, as a consequence. Uh, um, this is just a quick point on this. Uh, we have only begun to innovate in this space. Um, the opportunity for innovation is extraordinary and we're already seeing some of that happening in California. There's a, a couple of remarkable companies. Clean Energy Systems is one uh, that does oxy-fired combustion of biofuels uh, to have a negative carbon footprint. Uh, like Sally was just talking about, it's not the alum cycle, it's a different technology. We have companies like uh, uh, Opus 12 that convert CO2 to chemicals and reuse. Companies like New Light that turn CO2 into plastics, like Blue Planet that turns CO2 into aggregate. California is a den of innovation around this as it is with many other things. Uh, and uh, I wanna actually open up a question to the entire panel on this. We got a question, uh, what companies are involved in this right now? Uh, who's focused on carbon capture and why? So before we start on that, I think there got to be a, some distinction between what Sally just mentioned versus the traditional carbon capture technologies. Mm -hmm. Because what Sally mentioned is really reinventing the way we convert energy sources to power. That's what we can get to the 100%. But if you're doing either membrane or solvent or sorbent technology, it's very hard to go to 100% capture. So that kind of tells you that instead of just adding environmental control units at the end of the tailpipe or a chimney, you really need to think about how to redesign the power system so that you don't make those uh, separation issues to start with. I think they're the beginning of the challenge. 
In terms of uh, CO2 capture technologies, all the ma major energy companies are in it, for sure, definitely. But we also have a lot of smaller uh, startup companies working on direct air capture for a long time. So there are many good companies out there like Climeworks, um, Global Thermostat, um, Carbon Engineering. These are the leading experts, I believe. Maybe to say a little bit on the <clears throat> carbon storage side, uh, actually, it's quite interesting. I mean, there are tech companies who are really interested in this. Uh, for example, if you're trying to reduce your scope three emissions, uh, carbon capture and storage is one of the most promising ways of, of doing that. So we're starting to see that. Uh, certainly, you know, oil and gas companies, you know, bring a, a huge amount of expertise. But we're also seeing uh, all kinds of companies that um, that uh, I think partially because now there's a prospect for economic um, you know, viability uh, with this. But we're starting to see lots of um, smaller companies positioning th themselves, for example, to be CO2 storage hubs. So a lot of action in this space. Uh, that actually bit prompts uh, uh, just a quick addition to that, by the way, a lot of the heavy equipment manufacturers, companies like Siemens and Honeywell and GE are very interested in these technologies and a lot of supply chain companies, a lot of companies that make systems and controls, for example, Johnson controls, uh, a lot of the companies providing AI services like IBM are all very interested in this. I think that also reflects a maturation of the industrial space. Uh, this prompts the question actually that that maturation is based on the expansion of the policy frameworks that we're seeing things like 45Q and LCFS and uh, other kinds of options. I wanted to open up to the panel again two questions. One of them is I wanted to talk about uh, what we think we're going to see in terms of additional sort of market aligning policies to help get more of this stuff in the market. And then second, a, a different set of policy levers, which is infrastructure. Um, in the power sector, we already have transmission lines. In CO2 capture and storage, we don't. So what, what do we think of in the context of infrastructure development, not just in California, but worldwide? Who wants to start on the policy stuff? Sally, Brianna? Yeah, I don't know, maybe I'll jump in. I mean, so one of the, the, the needs is for the incentives that are available today, things like 45Q and the low carbon fuel standard, um, they all have sunset clauses. And, and they also have clauses that require that they, um, uh, construction starts, for example, by the end of 2023. Uh, you know, in infrastructure years, you know, these are just a blink of the eye. So, so one of the things that could be done is to uh, extend the lifetime of these incentives so they have uh, greater certainty. Uh, that, that would help a lot. Um, and and that, would, that would go for both the low carbon fuel standard and the N45Q. With regard to uh, infrastructure, uh, large scale pipeline infrastructure, um, CCS is something that can really benefit from economies of scale. So what we're starting to see is uh, groups of states, you know, joining together, making plans for how they could have shared infrastructure. And there's detailed planning to go on behind that. There's also lots of interest in uh, legislation that would help support the, the, the build out of that. Uh, there's nothing really in place that will do that, but that's going to be quite important in certain portions of the country. Mm -hmm. It is certainly being discussed also in the context of stimulus or Green New Deal. Uh, for folks who are interested, uh, I refer you to betterenergy.org, which has done a lot of work on the pipeline infrastructure questions. Uh, Brianna, would you like to add anything to Sally's comments? Um, the only thing I was thinking about in addition is, you know, there are other policies that can benefit CCS if even though they don't necessarily seem like they would apply to them directly. Um, so for example, like California has a buy clean program, um, which requires them to the state to purchase, you know, low carbon products. Um, and so I think, you know, people traditionally think of CCS as being something that's done on like a coal fired power plant, but actually decarbonizing the industrial sector is one of the most important uses for CCS because there are a few other options for how to do that. So things like steel and cement um, can 
use CCS to reduce the carbon footprint of their products. Um, so a procurement standard, like a buy clean standard that says, you know, governments must buy low carbon products is another way to sort of indirectly benefit CCS. Um, because again, it's one of the few or only ways to actually decarbonize um, those industries. Right, yeah. and, and, and of course, go ahead. I can say a little bit more about that. So, so speaking specifically about California, so so California has a cap and trade program that um, the credits I think are about twenty to twenty five dollars a ton now. You know, if you added that to forty five Q, for example, all of a sudden cement plants it would be economically attractive to capture and store the CO two. Uh, today, whereas it isn't if you just have 45Q. Uh, but under the California laws, uh, CCS is not an eligible option to qualify as, a, as, a, as something that would uh, create an offset that you could use in, in a cap and trade market. So even if somebody did CCS because it's not certified as, a, as an emissions reduction uh, uh, approach, um, uh, you couldn't get credit for. You'd still have to pay your 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 carbon taxes for emitting into the atmosphere. So that's something that could be fixed. Uh, you know, really, uh, you know, in a very very straightforward way by adopting, for example, the low carbon fuel standard um, uh, CCS protocol that's already available in the state. Another very important area is in the electricity sector. So California has been really a leader in decarbonizing its, um, its uh, electricity system as very low carbon intensity. It's like half the carbon intensity of like natural gas. Um, but all of that has been built around uh, uh, technology programs such as renewable portfolio standards uh, where CCS again isn't eligible. Uh, so it could be very helpful, for example, with the SB 100 uh, legislation, which is focused on the 2045 goal of uh, carbon neutrality for the electricity system, uh, clarifying the eligibility of, of natural gas plants with CCS uh, as part of uh, complying with the SB 100 would be immensely valuable. Also, CCS, uh, you know, there's a lot of integrated resource planning that underpins the build out of the electricity system. And currently, uh, CCS is not allowed to be considered in those deliberations um, due to uncertainties about cost. Uh, fortunately, I think over the past uh, several years, there's been a lot more progress uh, on costs of capture from uh, power generation plants, in particular gas, that could certainly provide a planning basis uh, for that. So those are some examples of very concrete, tangible measures that could be taken that would uh, you know, give uh, CCS a stronger seat at the table as part of a portfolio of decarbonization options. Mm -hmm. uh, that specific issue of compliance option is a really important one. Um, we're starting to see that at the federal level too. Some of the draft legislation for 100% clean power standard is more explicit about not only the eligibility of uh, CCS, whether it's with a bioenergy or with a gas plant or whatever, but also about direct air capture as a compliance mechanism for the last few percent to really get to zero. Mm -hmm. um, and it's encouraging to see the policy mature that way. Speaking of policy mat maturation, we have two comments that are focused on the recent IRS uh, issues. One of them actually the issuance of the IRS guidance. The other uh, is an inspector general uh, a set of findings around the 45Q tax credit. Um, uh, First, uh, to, just to, to anyone, but again, it strikes me that Bri Brianna, this is your kettle of fish. Part of the delay we've seen in getting CCS deployed is that it took two and a half years to get the IRS guidance out. But now that we've got it, what does that help? How does the IRS guidance from Treasury help investors to think this through? Yeah, so there were some terms used in the 45Q credit that um, IRS needed to clarify, and one of the big ones was what it means to have secure storage. Um, so that IRS guidance now, there, you know, there was a pathway under the rule as it was written, but I think you know having this guidance just gives people um, the confidence that they know now what they need to do to actually demonstrate that they're securely storing the CO2. Um, so yeah, I think that's. I don't think we've seen the final yet, if I'm correct. Um, they put out uh, a version for a uh, request for comment. So I think we're still waiting to get the actual like final regulations that are gonna mm -hmm. um, be applicable to it. But yeah, just having that confidence, the regulatory confidence that you know people know what they have to comply with, I think is really important. 
um, to giving people the confidence to actually start building those projects. Right, and one of the amendments that's being considered now is to extend the timeline for startup construction, in part because the IRS took so long. <laughs> uh, and that's also good news. Uh, can you comment on the, uh, you know, uh, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration findings, if you re if you remember any of that? I, I can talk about it, but again, you're closer to it. Yeah, well, you can maybe help me fill in the gaps of the things I don't remember, but yeah, there, there was a finding that um, there have been a large share of credits claimed where it's unclear if they have actually met the requirements to demonstrate secure storage. Um, and so I'm not uh, completely sure what actions are being taken to clarify that. Julia, maybe you know um, what mm -hmm. they're doing, but yeah, I mean, there is a legitimate concern that um, people are claiming this credit without having actually taken the steps that are necessary to show that they are storing it correctly. Right. Uh, there were two take homes for me on this and then one sort of additional thought. One of the take homes is that the system worked. People who are trying to get credit without having done the work aren't getting the credit. The action that was actually taken is the credits are being held pending investigation. The second is that even though it was a large number of companies, it was a small number of credits actually. It was only about 10% of the credit pool to my recollection, uh, which again suggested that 90% of the credits were being associated with good behavior so uh, again, it, it sort of strikes me as a system works kind of story. Um, it does, however, uh, uh, as, as sort of a meta message, it shows that you really actually need to have a full system of stuff in place. There's always fraudulent action out there and it's by no means restricted to CCS. There's many companies that do this in the power sector and manufacturing and other sort of things. It's part of why actually you need strong regulatory bodies to make sure that this work gets done. Yeah, um, and I think the companies who, you know, are most strongly invested seeing, in seeing CCS become successful um, see that as well and want those strict rules to be in place. It was <laughs> funny that this was a headline making um, incident, but when I was working with the Natural Resources Defense Council, we and Greenpeace submitted a set of comments on what the 45Q guidance um, should look like. And the headline was that, um, you know, environmental groups and oil companies agree on what 45Q should look like because apparently Occidental Petroleum submitted a very similar set of comments to ours. So I think, the, like I said, the companies who are really invested in seeing this succeed also want those strong um, and clear rules in place. Mm -hmm. Excellent. We've got about 10 minutes left here. Um, uh, let me try something. If, if the panelists have seen a specific question they would like to address themselves, uh, choose one and off you go. I'm, I'm keen to get your guys maximum input on this. Uh, I've got, I've, I'm happy to keep doing this, but if you'd like to tackle a specific question you've seen by all means. Uh, Alyssa, do you wanna, did you see something of interest? Sure, um, kind of take, uh, piggybacking on the previous discussion, as a person who's not in policy, but I see that there could be a potential challenges in terms of how to give proper carbon credit because uh, doing life cycle analysis or doing carbon accounting is not a straightforward, especially uh, when you try to do import and export of goods in different countries and so on, it gets complicated extremely fast. So having a good set of guidelines and uh, when you have products, I totally agree with this Sally that that's why I hate to sometimes put CCU with the CCS in the same bucket. Only reason we kind of do it because expertise kind of overlap so that we advance science together, but the role CCU versus CCS plays are very different for the future. And I think that has to be very clear. And in order to really understand what CCU do, does, you also need to know the permanency of the product, like how much are you putting CO2 out of the circulation in atmosphere? And uh, all those are not really critical, uh, not trivial so that coming up with the right protocol or how to do this calculation more accurately will really help the policymakers to have a better policy towards the deployment i think uh, something specific on that actually is california's already done that uh, the ccs protocol for better or for worse has laid out an accounting methodology and it's something to build on as we go forward sally you were going to add to that well i'm not going to add to that i was had another question i wanted to answer please and it was, uh, it was a question from Maury uh, Wolfson, and, and it was a, a statement, um, <clears throat> but it, it, um, <clears throat> it uh, sort of 
please understand the realities of the thermodynamics, net energy analysis and parasitic energy. Um, so sort of at worst today, uh, <clears throat> about 30% of the energy, for example, from an old inefficient coal plant would need to be diverted to uh, carbon capture uh, so that it would basically derate the power output of the plant. So, you know, yes, 30% is not an efficiency hit that, that uh, you know, is desirable. There are um, uh, newer solvents now and it, with better heat integration, it's possible to reduce the energy penalties for uh, carbon capture and storage to less than less than say 20% or so. Uh, if we look at some of the, the new alum cycle technologies, because it's actually a completely different cycle, you can actually have the, the exact same um, energy efficiency uh, as you do, for example, today with a natural gas combined cycle plant, but you can have that with 100% capture with, without an energy penalty. So, uh, you know, you're absolutely right that, you know, we need to think about the parasitic energy, but sort of at worst, it's kind of 30% and at best, it's nothing. Um, so I, I think that's, that's an important point, you know, and, and then the other issue is, you know, a question of scale. You know, can we do that this, this at the scale that we need? Um, and if you look in the US, uh, so, so generally the view is that, you know, CCS needs to contribute something on the order of 15% of global emissions reductions to sort of fulfill its role in the hard to decarbonize sectors and for, you know, providing a load following electricity and so forth. So if you look at the global capacity estimates for uh, CO2 storage, you know, they range from sort of a low of uh, about 5,000 gigatons up to a high of, you know, 20,000 gigatons when you start including things like offshore Gulf of Mexico and, and so forth. So if you compare that to, you know, the sort of 15% of emissions, what that's maybe, what, you know, five to, you know, say, say between five to 10 gigatons a year, you know, the, the scale of the storage resource is enormous. And that doesn't even include storing CO2 in basalts or mineralization or, or, or other things. So there's no fundamental uh, uh, geological limit to, to the scale of the operation. So that then just brings it back to, well, you know, could we do this at a scale that, um, you know, could we have an industrial infrastructure? You know, and I think what you need to think is if we're doing five to 10 gigatons a year of CO2 capture and storage, we're talking about something that would be on the order of the scale of the, you know, the existing oil and gas industry, you know, which is certainly something that, something that is, you know, operating today when this fact we rely on for all of the, or 85% of the fuels we use. So I, I don't think that there are any fundamental showstoppers. I, I think there are economic issues, uh, there are structural issues um, uh, about this technology, but there, I don't see any fundamental limitations to being able to make big progress. And when you broaden carbon management to <clears throat> include natural climate solutions and so forth, um, you know, these, this is a big important set of technologies. And if we're gonna get to net zero, and if we're going to do it soon enough to avoid, uh, you know, overheating the planet, um, you know, we've got to take advantage of all these things that are available. Uh, I want to actually use that as a segue to two quick questions for the whole panel that we're going to use to close. One of them is, uh, I want to read it verbatim because it's an interesting question. Would the panelists care to comment on the, any of the forms of natural CO2 sequestration that don't have the same containment certainty questions as engineered sequestrations? I am not aware of any healthy soil proponents having to guarantee their land will never be disturbed. Thoughts, comments? Well, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. No, I just, yeah, I gotta say, I mean, I think, yeah, natural solutions, things like um, afforestation, reforestation, you know, improved agricultural practices are, are definitely an important component of um, negative emissions. Um, although I would say that, you know, the reversibility of those is one of the major concerns. Um, and so that in, co in combination with scale, I mean, there are things that we can deploy right now, which is great, and we should be doing that. But they just can't scale to the level that we need them to. And things like forest fires or changing the land use um, can unfortunately reverse the benefit you get from that. Sally? 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, geologic storage, you know, does is held to an extremely high bar uh, for, for permanence. And, and I think that's one of the, the benefits of geological storage. You know, with regard to natural climate solutions, I think in almost other natural like afforestation or, or particularly reforestation, um, uh, soil carbon storage associated with agriculture, many times there are significant co-benefits of doing those things that, that, that you know, even beyond the, the pure you know, carbon dioxide um, removal uh, benefit. So I think that we need to have a very holistic view about some of these other solutions and maybe the carbon storage isn't as permanent as say putting it deep underground, but if you can improve soil quality so that you need less water and less fertilizer and there's less erosion and uh, you know, that's a huge benefit. And if we can protect forest ecosystems that help with, uh, you know, the health of uh, watersheds that are providing valuable water resources, you know, that's incredibly valuable. So, uh, so I think it's not just about the carbon when you look at these sort of nature-based solutions. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Julie uh, Mourinho Carella in just a moment. But before I do, uh, we've got just a minute here for everybody. If there's a pause, closing thought that you'd like to add to this discussion, I'm keen to have it. Uh, Dr. Park, if you'd like to go first. So kind of going back to your last question, nature, the mother nature, the earth has been balancing carbon for a long time, even before we showed up. And they're still doing, it's still doing it. Uh, we are just disturbing the cycle. So in a sense, the nature-based um, options has to be there as a big portfolio for sure. And one of the thing is the carbon monologization, things like that we should definitely do. But as Sally mentioned, they're added benefit, but at the same time, when you turn a lot of knobs in nature, everything else will change as well. So all these measures, we need to always include the nature into the equation when you try to develop technology. And that's the um, most sustainable way to get to the uh, carbon constraint board. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brianna, your closing thoughts. Yeah, um, I think as we've you know, been discussing, carbon capture and carbon removal are gonna be absolutely critical to meeting our climate goals. Um, California has a really um, important opportunity to be a leader on this. Um, there's uh, a lot of work to be done, but the foundations um, are certainly there to deploy this at scale. Um, so I think it's just waiting for us to um, coordinate to work together um, and to, to actually see these things deployed at scale. Dr. Benson, last word for you. Yeah, I mean, I think speed and scale are really crucial if we're gonna win the war against climate change and, and CCS is one of the, one of the important parts of, of speed and scale in, in meeting our, our goals. Outstanding. Uh, I wanna provide one closing thought aligned with that, which comes from a question. Uh, there is often a criticism that CCUS is somehow a sop to the oil industry, that it's just extending a dead industry um, I think your final point here that we need speed and scale, we need every ore we can in the water, uh, and CCS is one of those things. Um, and in that a context, I could not have asked for a better set of panelists than the ones that we have. Uh, I'm so grateful that all of you were here. Thank you so much, and thank you to the audience again. Uh, a couple of quick words in closing before turning it back to Julie. Uh, I want to uh, mention that the full video recording of this event will be available on our website in a few days. We also have another event coming up soon, Demystifying Green Hydrogen, that will be held Monday, November 23rd at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can go to energy.columbia.edu, uh, I'm sorry, energypolicy.columbia.edu, uh, look at our events page and you can see all of our events there. Uh, with that, Thank you all again, and I'm turning you back to Julie for closing thoughts. Still can't hear you. It's that thing again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I was saying thank you everybody for joining us today. This was a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Kate, for giving a keynote remarks. 
um, and Professor Sally Benson, Dr. Lisa Park, and Brianna Schmidt. Um, thank you for joining in this conversation. Julio, as always, great moderation. Um, and we look forward to the next um, uh, Women Energy CCUS um, uh, conversation in the coming year. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.